Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Daniel Dorado, Howard Yermish, and John Atwood. Coming up on DTNS, Elon faces a bitter pill. Google wants to whisper sweet notifications at your plants. And don't hate, locate with what three words. Daily Tech News for Friday, April 15th, 2022. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. From somewhere in St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Got a good show ahead for y'all. We will be talking about Twitter, but we've got a new spin on it. There's a lot of information that happened since yesterday. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. A joint advisory from CISA, the FBI, NSA, and Department of Energy warns that threat actors have developed custom toolkits that allow them to scan for and compromise vulnerable industrial control systems, specifically ones using logic controllers from Schneider Electric and Omron, which means a lot of them. While no specifics on the tools were given, the advisory warned that this approach could disrupt critical devices or functions. Peloton increased its subscription fees in the U.S. and Canada for the first time. So as of June 1st, all access plans increased $5 per month to $44 in the U.S. However, Peloton cut the prices on its hardware. With its bike cut 18% to $1,445, Bike Plus down 20% to $1,995, and Tread down 7% to $2,695. Opera released its crypto browser for iOS and iPadOS. Of course, Opera launched this browser back in beta in January for Windows, Mac, and Android, and it offers things like a built-in crypto wallet and access to Web3-based apps. Asus launched the ZenBook 14X OLED Space Edition, which uh, includes a 3.5-inch OLED display on the lid. And it also comes with a 12th Gen Intel i9-12 12900G, 32 gigs of RAM, and a 90 hertz OLED main display. It's available now for $2,000. And Bloomberg's Mark German sources say Apple began testing third-party apps with at least nine new Mac models running an M2 chip. According to App Logs, it includes a MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, and Mac Mini with a standard M2, new MacBook Pros with M2 Pro and Max chips, and a Mac Pro with a successor to the M1 Ultra chip. The logs also show tests with a Mac Mini running an M1 Pro as well. All right, let's talk a little bit more about uh, notifications and how we might uh, get them delivered to us more efficiently. Yeah, you know, with with smartphones, you know, you got IoT, now wearables increasingly, just other gadgets, you know, increasingly we're just beset with notifications, whether it's, you know, banners popping up at the top of screens, we got ringing chimes at inopportune times, wrist vibrating all the time, it can be distracting at best, anxiety inducing, at worst, cue, there, there's got to be a better way moment. Well, Google designers at Seed Studio worked with the London-based Map Project Office on some different ideas for notifications with a set of projects called Little Signals. The idea is to create more relaxed ways to send notifications, and there are some interesting concepts in this set. The one that's getting a lot of press is an air device that basically pulses air to move a nearby object or thing, thinking like a plant, to get your attention in a very subtle way. There's a button concept that raises a button, as you one might expect from the name, to alert you before playing a tone to ultimately get your attention to kind of depress the button to let it know, hey, I need to check this notification. There's also a movement object that has seven pegs in a little row. It's almost like, I don't know, like a little pencil holder. And that breaks out uh, to that kind of peek out each of these little pegs peeks out to get convey motion and get your attention in a variety of, <laughs> I'm assuming, whimsical Wait. ways. There's also a rhythm device that plays ambient noises with varying levels of intensity, and that can be silenced with a wave of your hand, so think wind chimes, that kind of stuff. And then there's a tap device that has a little propeller that can tap a surface with varying intensity levels. And last, a shadow device that casts a shadow that can pulse and grow over time. Again, all of these are trying to get away from, hey, something's buzzing in my pocket, uh, you know, uh, the the ring on my uh, Alexa lit up or something like that. And What's interesting, perhaps the most, is that these aren't just kind of one-off concepts or something like that. Seed Studio has put up the design files and the code to get these to work so you can actually create these and kind of iterate these and try out these concepts on your own. You know, this isn't just uh, an, an interesting tech demo, which it also is. Yeah. 
I, I love the idea that we're trying to think outside the box as far as notifications go. I have... I mean, when it comes to email notifications for absolutely everything, they're 100% turned off. Uh, you know, anytime I get one, I'm like, unsubscribe, hate you, uh, even if I like the <laughs> service otherwise. But I also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rocking the Apple Watch uh, as, a, you know, pretty recently. And I'm trying to navigate, okay, what notifications are important to get on the watch if I would also get them on my phone? And where, where do I get them in both places just in case my phone isn't near me? But those notifications are all kind of the same thing, right? You're, you're getting a buzz, you're getting some sort of a chime, and it would be kind of cool, somewhat weird. I, I don't exactly know how it would be in practice, but it'd be kind of cool if one of my plants could like wave at me you know, and, I'd, <laughs> and I would know, yeah, there's, some, there's something that I need to address at some point. Patrick, are you going to have plants waving at you anytime soon? No, I'm envisioning a dancing Groot as as my personal uh, <laughs> notifications totem. I'm also feeling this. I you know recently upgraded iOS on my phone, and one of the features is that it'll turn calendar information into a notification for things I already have set into my alarm system. So now I'm getting alarm and notification for Google Calendar, notification from the calendar built into iOS, and. I'm feeling, uh, and I, I'm kind of annoyed by notifications to begin with. I shut them off for the vast majority of apps I have. So it's, it's uh, part of me think this is really exciting, and part of me is already open in Seed Studios looking for files uh, to implement them. And part of me is wondering, like, okay. And then there's a... Um, a, a service like a gig economy and and someone will come to your house and bang on your door with a hammer so you don't ignore that alarm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it seems like, you know, we've gone from like, okay, your phone is completely worn out of your worn out your ability to actually care about it, right? And your your watch, if you have a smart watch, is probably also something you, you work hard to ignore. So it's interesting, I think, that they're going to more subtle or more relaxed things. And I'm mm -hmm. also wondering how many heart attacks are going to be when somebody walks by one of the more subtle notifications. You know, I'm imagining Sarah like, how long has my plant been waving for? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> or like, is my is it just that my window's open and there's a slight breeze? I mean, there are obviously a lot of questions here. I think for me, it's like if it's a notification that's important to have something that's a little bit more zen of a notification isn't really going to help me. It's more of... Right. How, how do you know that you need to deal with something? Whether or not you take action on that notification right then and there or you you know wait till later, is that, that's different. But it yeah. all seems invasive to me. I mean, it, it, it just is by nature. It's, it's you're being interrupted with, with somebody knocking on the door saying, there's a thing and we want to <laughs> share it with you. Well, yeah, it's it's all about it's all about triaging with these kind of things, and then the, like the like you're right, the vast majority of these probably need to be turned off. Like you need to be curate these. These don't solve the curation right. problem. The the where I see possible like kind of issues with these is a couple of these are pretty ambiguous like the air one like like you mentioned did i leave a window open is there a stiff breeze or did i get a <laughs> notification so if there's when there's ambiguity that that is going to increase your anxiety because then you're just going to check the thing that that's going to notify you about anyway you're going to bring right. out the phone anyway just looking and, at your plant all you know, day but I, I do think a couple of them, like the button concept, the video they posted for that, like I could definitely see that being like, at least like sending an acknowledgement, like I know there's a notification, right. I'm on the way to check that. I think the movement one definitely has some potential. And we've seen devices like this. I remember, uh, what was it? Think Geek had like a little like Bluetooth penguin that would like raise its arm when you got an email. You could like program it to do that and that kind of stuff. So yeah. we we've we know that notifications are can be horrible and we know that there are more organic ways or at least less intrusive ways to do that. I I, I like these ideas though. I like that they're trying out design solutions to this problem. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there was a company called Namastog for years. And unfortunately, I got rid of my old Namastog rabbits before I moved. Um, but what they were doing is experimenting years and years ago with the idea of using the cloud and to do things like this little mechanical rabbit with ears. You could get the ears to move. It could read messages to you. Mm -hmm. You could program all sorts of stuff. And they recently actually did a whole Kickstarter to replace the technology inside of them, the boards inside of them with more current hardware. But I feel like this is something that goes all the way back to the, remember the first time you could do custom ringtones and, you know, <laughs> you would hear like, you know, if it, it, people would sometimes work very hard to make sure you never heard their ringtone for you, or you worked really hard <laughs> to make sure like your boss didn't hear your ringtone for them. You, you know, the, the whole the whole Darth Vader march for your boss. That tells a lot about what you think about that person that's calling you. <laughs> 
Well, in the ongoing Twitter roller coaster saga that is Elon Uh-oh. Musk, uh, here's what we know. <laughs> And and gosh darn it, a lot of things have happened since yesterday's show. So on Thursday, Twitter CEO Parag Agrawal told employees that the company's board was still evaluating Musk's $43 billion offer to take the company private. In related news, an SEC filing showed that Vanguard Group increased its stake in Twitter to 10.4% over the course of Q1, meaning that it is now the single largest shareholder Musk remaining the largest individual shareholder. Speaking at a TED at 22 conference, Musk said he had a plan B if his bid was rejected. Well, fast forward a few short hours while some of us slept. Now we have what's known as a poison pill. That's a strategy meant to slow or block Musk's $43 billion bid to buy Twitter. That's something that Twitter's doing. Now, Friday, Twitter's board enacted this defensive measure, which gives Twitter's existing shareholders time to purchase additional shares at a discount. It importantly also dilutes Musk's ownership stake. Bloomberg notes that poison pills are common among companies that are under fire from activist investors or in hostile takeover situations. The poison pill strategy, if you're not familiar, and some of you are, uh, I, I did a little research on it last night. It's it was so started 1980s. By, it, <laughs> yes, it was started by law firms in the 1980s to protect companies from corporate takeovers Uh, essentially letting a takeover target flood the market with new shares or allow existing shareholders other than the bidder to then buy those shares at a discount. That means anybody trying to acquire the company has to negotiate directly with the board, which Musk wasn't really doing anymore. Now, Twitter said that this effort will be in place until April 14th, 2023. So it's like almost buying the company a year of time, but it won't keep the company from holding talks about a sale with any other potential buyer So this poison pill gives it more time to negotiate a different deal. Speaking of other deals, the New York Post and Bloomberg are both reporting that private equity firm Tom Bravo is working on a possible bid for Twitter as well. This roller coaster, I want off, but I can't get off yet (laughs) because it's a really long ride in a very short week. (laughs) Poison pills. Who's more familiar with them than me? Who can tell me more about this? (laughs) I, short answer is, uh, it's funny, right? Because the other thing that came out was Vanguard dumped some more money into uh, Twitter stocks so that they're now the single largest shareholder in Twitter. Mm-hmm. And yeah. they had a lot. I mean, they they already had like several hundred million dollars, I guess, tied up in Twitter. So I can imagine, you know, you're 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 an executive. You're a whatever whatever you are inside of Vanguard, right? You've got billions, you know, under management or trillions, I guess, under management at Vanguard, and some yuts starts messing around in a way that could a screw up your long-term hopes for the stock or screw up your short-term hopes for the stock or just mess up the company you have millions of hundreds of millions of dollars tied into and they're probably like you know what we're not getting any coverage nobody's offering us a seat in the board nobody writes about our holdings you know people are writing about how okay elon's backing away and the stock's going to crash and there's going to be other possible takeover bids and all of a sudden like i you know i feel like vanguard came up and said <clears throat> It's not just the kid with the weed thing. It's us. And I, I don't I don't want to I'm not trying to be rude to Elon Musk because every time I see a rocket land itself, I'm delighted. And but he he does a lot of stuff that probably irritates a lot of investors. Um, it certainly <laughs> irritated the SEC, his relationship or what he mm-hmm. does on Twitter. So I feel like, you know, there's some great big companies stepping up in this case vanguard being like okay before just remember you know he may he may have attention span issues but we do not and we own a big chunk of this company so back off people um at least that's what it smells like the whole thing has just been so bizarre and i cannot imagine having to cover it every day this week so you you have my sympathy sarah just like this is because it gets weirder and weirder it, uh, it, yeah, it really, it, these sorts of things sometimes drag out, but it, this has been, uh, it, uh, I don't know, full force since Monday. <laughs> it is well, no Friday and so much has happened. The other thing this makes me think is the more this dragged out is, you know, uh, by, by Twitter choosing, I guess, to do this stock quantitative easing for, you know, for lack of a, you know, poison pill, whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, the idea that, you know they're they're putting more shares out there for for existing shareholders buy this this raises the amount of overall stock dilutes any existing you know share that Elon or like the total percentage of Twitter that Elon owns. I do wonder Elon is a very 
online person. I think that is not an uncontroversial statement to say. And it, it, I, I do wonder if there's going to be a weird element where we start to see like the stonks and Wall Street bets, like trying to, to trying to like be silly and and do something along these lines because you're basically saying like hey anyone that's not elon musk please buy this stock at a discount um you know for, patrick for i see you have some thoughts for sarah's emotional well-being yeah if, you, if you're not watching the video you can't see me holding my hand up for sarah's emotional well-building just just <laughs> hope that the whole stonks crew stays out of this i don't think she can take another week of, <laughs> and twitter moved 73 percent last night I mean, I think really what this all comes down to is on a on a, a, a totally personal level, it's like, okay, what's the worst that's going to happen here as just a person who uses Twitter, which is me? I don't know. It, it gets burned to the ground. My life won't be over. Uh, you know, we'll we'll all figure out something else. You know, there'll be another social network. There are plenty of others already. But this is something that has been part of my life for a really long right. time. And, you know, I know everybody on the panel feels the same way and you can use. I think we might have lost Sarah, but to to kind of reiterate what she was saying, you know, uh, as Justin was kind of talking about yesterday, it's it's increasingly vital for a lot of media organizations as well. Right. So, uh, you know, th there is a lot there's obviously there's a lot of interest and, and a lot invested uh, in Twitter going forward. And one note, you know, I, I know this, this Tom Bravo uh, private equity rumor is out there and we usually don't get into a lot of like private equity talk around here. But one interesting thing I think is that uh, they recently uh, spun off Barracuda networks. They sold it to another private equity firm for like $4 billion. Now they, they're, mm -hmm. they're a private equity firm. They have piles and piles of cash everywhere, but I'm just saying they just freed up a bunch of cash. Theoretically, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. wanted to get into some Twitter, some Twitter stock. Might be good timing. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have a thought about uh, this particular story or anything that we talk about on the show, we have an email address and we'd love for you to use it. Here it is. Email us at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. This week, the mapping company What Three Words announced a partnership with Subaru, adding to a list of automaker partnerships that include Mercedes Benz, Jaguar Land Rover, Ford, Lamborghini, Lotus, and Mitsubishi. Subaru says What Three Words will be integrated into its new Outback going forward. What Three Words was founded in 2013 and divides the planet into three meter squares with each square getting an identifier of three random words. So like something like your home has, you know, a couple, maybe a dozen squares or something like that, depending on how big it is. So Patrick, seems like all of our phones, cars, we already got GPS, right? I mean, my smartwatch probably has it, right? So why do we need what three words? What is this offering? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so short answer, right, is because saying prepare.clear.tilt is a lot easier than saying 125 South 600 West Price Street, Utah, 84501, uh, and gives you a much more precise location. And if you're wondering why I pulled out a really random address in Utah, that's the location of the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, which is one of my favorite places in Utah. Uh, if you've seen an Allosaurus, it probably came out of the rock there. And let me back up for a second, right? Like what three words sounds familiar. Um, last year, right, actually about a year ago exactly, give or take a couple weeks, uh, DTNS talked about what three words dropping a cease and desist on the folks behind what free, F-R-E-E -E words, an mm -hmm. open source tool for security researchers that wanted to kind of dig into the whole what three words concept. So what three words insisted that, uh, you know, what free words was, you know, Basically, uh, including some of their copyrighted code, it never really, basically, they ceased, they desisted, the case never went anywhere. We don't really know where the code came or did not come from. But um, so, you know, when you when you look at what three words, there's, there's three by three meter squares, that's 10 foot squares, uh, like you're measuring your roof for new shingles in American. Um, but it's there's 57 trillion of those. And they take about 25,000 words to create a dictionary, and then they randomly apply those words to the locations on the surface of the planet. It's fascinating math. So as somebody that's had to navigate uh, using latitude and longitude, for example, the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry would be 39.3232 by negative 110.6877. Uh, that's with an, an accuracy of 11 meters, or about 33 feet. Um, citing those numbers, especially in an emergency, can be a huge challenge, and addresses are really problematic. If you're in a big state park, if you're in a big, uh, if you're in a big park in a city, if you're in a big national park, uh, you probably don't have the ability to pull out latitude and longitude and saying, well, I was three miles north or I, I just walked. It's, it's giving directions is vague. And one of the places that what three words is showing up a lot 
is in emergency services, you know, because look, the other funny thing is like, you've got Google maps in your phone, you know, Uber has mapping, everybody has mapping. Um, and for the most part, it does fine. Right. Uh, but if you're a package delivery company or Uber or somebody that lives in an apartment building with three entrances or an office park with eight buildings and where they have one big master address, um, getting, you know, saying like weasel cope candle is probably a lot easier than explaining that. Well, you drive around Blowhard Avenue, you take the second right, then drive around the back, <laughs> turn a left at the dumpsters, and then you'll see a white building, but not white like the other buildings because it's got a red stripe. And the second entrance on the right is the one you want to, to, you know, drop your stuff off, um, you know, or as, you know, to call out Subaru's announcement this week, uh, finding your spot in a campground. If having been to campgrounds where they were very, very large and very, very sprawly, uh, you know, a what three words address would have been a lot easier than literally, okay, go to the second Oak, make a left. And then at the second bathroom operation, take a left and you're the fifth slot on the right. Uh, notice that I'm, pointing in the wrong direction as I say that because I'm recalling an experience I had in Southern California. In any case, <laughs> um, so what three words says at least one delivery service reduced their delivery times by something like 28% wow. after implementing what three words. Yeah, it's, that's a big number. Um, as of June last year, the Los Angeles Fire Department uh, implemented what three words into its emergency app, I believe. Uh, 2020, the Australian Emergency Services 000 emergency plus app started using it um it's kind of crazy it's available in something like 4800 emergency call centers in the u.s uh built into rapid sos and other uh software systems for call centers it's a really fascinating concept i don't know if it's perfect but one as a nerd uh or a geek or whatever you want to call me uh lovingly or not so lovingly my it's a fascinating piece of math to me like the idea of actually divvying up the surface of the planet like that there are claims that i've read about uh that similar sounding words or plurals are used in locations that are just miles apart um mm -hmm. the uh i think it's the mountain rescue england and wales uh the story about that was in june 2021 so they're saying like look um there were cases, you know, I think they, they cited like uh, 45 incorrect locations in the previous 12 months. They didn't say what the total number is. What, you know, was it 45 out of 100? What is it 45 out of 45,000? We don't know. But they said that where the wrong addresses were given. The quote from that is, quote, we are finding there are a lot of spelling issues, which might be from when locations are given to the emergency services. Right. Local accents have also been a problem. If you've ever traveled in Wales, you, you, and you're not Welsh, you know that English is a complicated language. If you've ever traveled to, you know, parts of the United States, you can kind of stare blankly while you're trying to figure out what somebody said, but it's an, it's an interesting concept. Um, part of the reason the what free words operation came out is because they were trying to figure out if there were cases where plurals or similar sounding words were relatively close to each other. And you might be like, ah, they're off by a mile. Well, if you're sending a helicopter for an emergency rescue or you're starting some type of rescue operation, or if you're the Los Angeles Fire Department being sent to the exact location the first time rather than a few miles away is the difference between life and death or a house burning down or not burning down. You know, if you have an active imagination, you're probably leaping ahead uh, on this. So well, the, the the first thing that springs to mind also beyond emergency services is, you know, we've been covering a lot about the increasing uh, uh, prevalence of drone delivery. And I'm just thinking a 10 meter square or a 10 foot square right. uh, is like the perfect landing area to designate for a drone also. Oh, so yeah. it's like I want it in a specific <laughs> spot in my backyard, uh, send it to, you know, yeah. dog, fox, uh, uh, frightening or something like that. Like, boom, it's right there, you know. <laughs> Uh, so I, I now have to look that up. <laughs> so, Patrick, is 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 there a um, a perpetuity to this? I guess like that that would be my only other question is like if I can memorize like a spot, is is that locked in? Like is that is like how do I guess how do they uh, uh, kind of keep that locked in? You know, in a way since like longitude and latitude is numerically based, like right. It is ancient science that has been set down. No, yeah, I don't I, think I, they I, are. I don't uh, I, I, <laughs> it's numbers, so it must be per perpetual. Well, you hope, right? Um, mm. You know, I'm sure somebody's. I'm sure there's going to be some great follow up emails on this. You know, one of the challenges of of any technology that comes out of a privately held company, whether it's an operating system that's driving you insane, or, for example, how many times if we wish there was an open source alternative to streaming programs that didn't cause us to spend 20 minutes a week dealing with stuff that we thought we solved last week, um, although. <laughs> You know, you know what I mean? Like it's, it mm -hmm. would, uh, you know, 
I'm going to brazenly assume that they did their, their math properly. And if they, you know, and that, that, that's a question, right? Cause they, I typed in, this is a fun one. So I typed in dog Fox frightening and there's dogs, Foxy frightening near Mendy Oromaya. There's doggedly Foxy frightening near Gebre Garacha Oromaya. And there's dogs, Fox, Foxy frightens near Erode Tamil Nadu. Now two of those things, <laughs> You know, I, I feel like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have to have three maps open simultaneously because I'm like, I think that's a place I've never heard of. Mendy Oromaya. And where is that? <laughs> if I put my keys on the so right part of the That's actually just kind of a fun game. Be like, let's just find something in the world. Just, yeah. Like, like I, well, it, in, it's, it's almost the reverse. It's hmm. almost the reverse of um, like that XKCD uh, uh, password generator, right? It's like think of three random words and that's the most secure <laughs> yeah. password. So yeah, uh, it, it yeah definitely a, a fascinating concept. And I could see that like if your Apple Watch pops that up in a case of an emergency to give that information out. Uh, again, a lot easier to transmit than uh, yeah. uh, despite dialectical differences than longitude and latitude in a lot of cases. It's, you know, in a lot of cases, I think it's going to be, I, I think it's an interesting idea. It's certainly, I mean, you know, if you've ever dealt with latitude and longitude, you know, one part of you is like, I'm a hoopy fruit, I can make this work. And another part of you is like, was that 3232 or 2323? Two, three, two, three, and is that going to put them three yards off or 300 miles off if you, if you mess a digit up? So yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to watch how it develops over time. And just so everybody knows, because radio silence is always awesome, <laughs> those two locations are 758 kilometers apart in Ethiopia. So, uh, well, uh, if if y'all can hear me, uh, I would <laughs> like to tell you about a tip that Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler, has for you if you find yourself vacationing. In Southern California, maybe you're going to a theme park, maybe you're going to Disney World in Florida, and you unfortunately end up needing some medical help. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. A couple of years ago when we went on vacation, I think most of us didn't think about the possibility of needing a doctor, but that may have changed in the last two years. And so I thought it was an interesting announcement that if you're in a hotel near Disneyland, Disney World, Universal Studios, Hollywood, or Knott's Berry Farm, you can go to drtoomey.com and book a hotel house call. And so this is a house call system that you can use at home, but it's now going to be available in these vacation areas so that if you do run into a problem, you can set up a house call with anything from a podiatrist because you walk too much to an OBGYN to somebody who can do that COVID test for you. Hopefully you won't need it, but if you do, Dr. 2, the number 2, me.com. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Always good advice from Chris. Uh, thank you for the tip. Uh, we also got an email. This one comes from Sheila. Uh, we Last week in episode 4250, we told you that scientists at Washington State University had developed a memristor for neuromorphic computing using honey. And Sheila wrote <laughs> and said, all I can think of is how much Terry Pratchett would love this. He used honeycomb and bees for ROM and hex. And this is just <laughs> chef's kiss. <laughs> that is that is a fantastic pull. Uh, uh, well played, Sheila. Well played. Well played. Also, well played, Patrick Norton. Uh, always nice to have you on the show. Thanks for being with us today. And what's been going on in your world otherwise? Uh, working on a studio rebuild and, as always, doing AV Excel with Robert Heron. We talk about uh, home theater and audio and headphones and all that good stuff and possibly going to axpona next week which is a big old trade show and that would be at patrick norton on the twitters if you want to blast something in my direction so excellent thanks all right i want to give a special thanks to scott napier who is one of our top lifetime supporters for dtns thanks Woo. for all the years of support scott Woo. Woo. And, of course, there's a longer version of this show called Good Day Internet. It's available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Here on DTNS, we are live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And you know what? We're going to be back Monday doing it all again. If you celebrate Easter, have a great Easter weekend, everybody.
This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterdeen. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Cap Kipper, Gadget First Grosso, Steve Guadarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Lem Peralta. Acast ad support from Tr- uh, Trace Gainer. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. And contributors for this week's show include Chris Ashley, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Patrick Norton. Thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>